I actually have here three problems, but between what I have, and I'm not sure what Mark has here, uh, it's a lot to be doing, especially considering that we have a reception tonight that we're supposed to go to, and uh, the time that we're supposed to go through the solutions is t tomorrow morning. So what I recommend, what I will ask, is only that you, you look at one problem. And uh, the way this worked when I was here three years ago was um, we would ask for volunteers to go through the solution, and uh, amazingly enough, uh, we actually had a usually had a volunteer, which surprised me because none of our students back home at New Hampshire would do that. <laughs> so, but if you if no there are no volunteers, then I'll go through the solution. But let's just keep it to one problem, and um, you can work as groups or pairs or however you want to do it. Uh, you can pick out whatever problem you like. Uh, it kind of depends on your background. Uh, I have three problems in here. The first one is kind of general magnetic reconnection, something called magnetic merging, so it applies to every field. Um, if you're mathematically inclined, it may not be too difficult. It kind of depends on your background. The second problem is really focused in on the energetics of flare loops. I'll show some pictures about it when I talk about it. If you're a solar person and you're particularly keen on flare loops and ribbon emissions, that might be good. It's a, it's a bit lengthy, so um, uh, it may be the hardest of the three. Again, depends on your background. And the third one, I think, might be the easiest. It's solar, but it's a little bit simpler mathematical. But it kind of depends on what your interests are, what your background is, or what's going to look easier. But anyway, just one. You don't have to do it alone. Um, and it's really trying to make this a learning exercise. I don't remember that we ever hand out any grades in this course, so, <laughs> so I don't think it's that critical. So. I'll get you to hand these out. You should hand these out for me. All right, well, you've got a, you've got a uh, chance to see kind of what it looks like. And uh, let me go ahead and start on, my, on the topic for this afternoon. <clears throat> Mark is still struggling back there. He's trying to make uh, Jan Soiko, one of our deans, do the homework. So <laughs> All right, there we are. Okay, I've been uh, tasked with the uh, uh, work of uh, talking about magnetic energy conversion in the sun and, uh, and also in planets. And uh, I'll confess right at the beginning that I'm mostly going to talk about the Earth's magnetosphere and not as much as I'm going to talk about the sun. Uh, I actually started out with my PhD working in magnetospheric physics here in this city, University of Colorado. Uh, a long time ago, about 45 years ago, 1968. And I worked, I did, did all my uh, thesis work on the magnetosphere, but on reconnection. And then I also worked at Los Alamos for a while on magnetospheric substorms. No, 
that's the other thing I haven't confessed oh. yet. <laughs> <laughs> One confession at a time. <laughs> so first I'm confessing that I'm not going to talk about the outer planets. Mark talked about it this morning. I have one slide in there, and he showed it, so I decided to take it out. And, uh, but I will talk quite a, a little bit about the Earth's uh, situation. And I'm also not talking about it because Fran Baganol isn't here yet, and she's worked a lot on the planets. And I knew that if I didn't say something about it, she'd kill me. But she's not here. She can't do that. And, uh, so the other confession I have to make is that I'm using very old PowerPoint software on a Mac. And uh, I have a lot of movies embedded in my talk. And none of them would run on the nice meeting system, which is why you can't find it uh, on, the, uh, uh, on your screen. And so I'm going to try to do this the old-fashioned way. I did actually go through the exercise of trying to learn how to use nice meeting and uh, do the questions and comments, and I figured that would so disrupt me that I would, I would spend at least half my time trying to figure out what was going on with that. Uh, so um, feel free, especially since you can't do it, to stop me, ask questions. You, if I'm not looking at the audience, just yell out, and I'll turn around and we'll do it that way. Um, so uh, I've spent most of my uh, undergraduate and, and career working on these two systems. Um, mostly in the last 30 years on solar flares, solar eruptions in particular. And always the way I've organized uh, my thoughts about this, particularly for the purpose of theory, is in terms of the energetics of the system. In the uh, case of the magnetosphere and the Earth, uh, you have most of the energy being brought in by the kinetic energy of the solar wind. Uh, that's more important than the magnetic energy in the solar wind and it's more important than the thermal energy. It's actually the ram pressure, the one half mv squared. That's where most of the energy lies. Um, and I can remember as a student here, going back 45 years ago, 68, going to my first meeting on magnetosphere. And very few people were talking about magnetic reconnection. There were a few speakers. And I was pulled aside by a professor from Kansas, whose name I won't say. Uh, who advised me as a young student not to pay any attention to those people talking about magnetic reconnections. It was a crackpot idea. Uh, everyone knew that the magnetic field in the solar one wind was far too weak. It's uh, you know, almost two orders of magnitude weaker than some of the field in the interior of the magnetosphere. Far too weak to have any importance uh, in the dynamics of the magnetospheric system. And so he was just doing that so that I wouldn't go down the wrong track. Yeah. And unfortunately, I didn't listen. I went down the wrong track. So here I am now talking about magnetic reconnection 45 years later. Uh, fortunately, that professor, or unfortunately, the professor is not around anymore, so um, I don't have to worry about what he thinks. Uh, anyway, so in the, uh, in the case of the solar wind, and this is also goes over the chapter that uh, Vitanis Vasilyunas wrote for the books, talks about this. Uh, it's really the kinetic energy of the solar wind. The magnetic energy density is weak, like that professor from Kansas said, uh, guy from Kansas said, and uh, uh, also thermal energy density is fairly weak. Plasma beta, for those of you who know about plasma beta, is about one. Uh, but what's important about the magnetic field that makes it so critical is it allows that kinetic energy to couple into the magnetosphere, something that doesn't really depend on the strength of the field. It's not the, the mag high magnetic energy content of the solar wind that's important. It's the ability of that field to tie into the terrestrial field and drag on it. The magneto tail, I don't have a nice extended picture, but that comet-like shape that we call the magneto sphere, even though it's not very spherical, um, stretches back for at least 1,000 Earth radii, even more like uh, two or 3,000. And uh, it's the magnetic field that, that tying into the Earth's field and dragging it back that creates that shape. Prior to... Um, Understanding that that was the case, people really thought the magnetosphere would be more like an egg shape. You just ignore the magnetic field. You have ram pressure that would push on the Earth's magnetic field, squeeze it up, and you can predict that very simply to be about 10 Earth radii on average. And if you have thermal pressure then that would close it in the back, the prediction is if you ignore the magnetic field, the magnetosphere will be closed on the tail at about 75 Earth radii, and everything will be self-contained. And that's what that guy from Kansas thought the magnetosphere would be like. As time went on, it began to become apparent that it's not like that. Now, in the uh, case of solar eruptions, one of the biggest <laughs> things that I found to be different was that whereas there were many people working in magnetospheric physics, senior people, that uh, very skeptical of reconnection for a long time. 
there's a lot of fighting going on at meetings about it. That went on for 20 years at least. Uh, everyone that I encountered in the uh, case of solar flares was sure that reconnection had something to do with it. And it was almost the opposite problem. You go to a meeting, some observer would present something, he'd see a hot spot in his data, there would be no imaging, and he would say, well, I think this hot spot was caused by reconnection. No magnetic field data, no nothing, just the hot plasma data. And everybody, I was astounded, everybody at the solar meeting would nod their heads and say, well, of course it's reconnection, what else could it be? And it was just like the opposite of what happened at magnetospheric meetings. So there's kind of the basic structures. Uh, I guess I could go through them a little bit. Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, the solar wind uh, is coming in at about Mach 8, both in regards to the sound speed and the, uh, the alphane speed. So there's a tremendous bow shock that's created. Uh, there's plasma enters in and is deflected by the Earth's field. So there's a magneto sheath, magneto sheath consisting mostly of the, of the solar plasma. And then uh, you uh, have that dragged out area. One thing I will mention here is the plasma sheet, not the plasma, well, the plasma sheet is the current sheet in the tail, or associated with the current sheet in the tail, but is this uh, plasma sphere right in here. Um, I'm not talking too much about planets, but the plasma sphere is where the rotation, rotation energy of the Earth dominates and actually whips the field around. So that magneto, that plasma sphere is co-rotating with the Earth. And when you get to Jupiter, the whole Jovian, most of the Jovian magnetosphere is like that. There's so much rotational energy and such a strong field in Jupiter that it is the rotational energy of the planet that drives everything more than the solar wind. Uh, so J Jupiter is a quite a different system. And then on the, uh, the flare side here, we have uh, an eruption that occurs. And it's not clear if reconnection has much to do with the eruption or not. Uh, some people push that it does. Others, including me, say that it's not really all that relevant to the onset of the eruption. But it plays a critical role once the field lines that erupt are dragged out and start to relax and recover. And um, that relaxation process creates uh, flare ribbons. You also get a shock wave that's created. The shocks are not as strong as the bow shock. They're typically less, uh, uh, the Mach number there is like 1.5 or 2, so they're much weaker shocks. Uh, and not, not quite as strong as the bow shock. If you think of it in terms of particle acceleration, that means they're not, in principle, they're not as effective, uh, except that the magnetic fields are stronger. And uh, we get this cavity, this bubble of magnetic field that's pushed out into interplanetary space in the really big events. Now, just uh, to get a little bit quantitative here, uh, if you look at these uh, two systems and compare some of these scale numbers that Mark was talking about this morning, uh, so we'll look at the plasma environments, so at the top, under parameter, I have a length scale. For the magnetosphere, I use the thickness of the terrestrial plasma sheet. Uh, so it's 10 to the 7 meters. The solar active region might be not a really big one, but a modest size one might be 10 to the 8 meters. Uh, the density in the plasma sheet is like 10 to the 5th particles per cubic meter, much higher in the solar active region in the corona, 10 to the 15. And then you can see also the, the magnetic field strength. Uh, B is like 10 to the minus 8 teslas, usually say like 10 nano teslas in the magnetic detail, whereas it's like a hundredth of a tesla uh, in, the, um, in the solar active regions, much stronger. And then there are those scale lengths. So there's the ion gyro radius, the ion inertial length, which Mark defined this morning. I've also added the collisional mean free path, which becomes more important for the sun than for the magnetosphere. And I've divided each one of them by the by the scale length parameter. So uh, you can get an idea of what processes um, are kind of important in each regime. For the terrestrial plasma sheet, uh, you can see that the ion gyro radius is about 10 to the minus 2 of the length scale. The ion inertial length is uh, 10 to the minus 1, a tenth. Uh, the collisional mean free path is 10 to the plus 9. So that means that particles travel a huge distance, many times the size of the plasma sheet or the magnetosphere, before they suffer a binary collision. So the magnetosphere is essentially a collisionless system. Um, you contrast that to the corona, to the solar active region. Um, ion gyro radius is very small. Magnetic fields are strong. The scale lengths are huge, much larger, a little bit about 10 times larger I have there. Uh, you can look at the ion inertial length. Uh, and then this collisional mean free path is now not huge, but many times smaller. Because that's 10 to the minus 4 right there, 
a lot of people see that number, 10 to the minus 4, and they say, oh, you mean you have 10,000 collisions when a particle travels across the active region. So that means it's, it's a collisional system, and I can use collisional plasma physics. Uh, not so fast. No, not really, it's not really the case, at least not for flares. Uh, and that's the purpose of this last slide which is the uh, kind of characteristic electric field you can generate from a dynamic process. The alphane speed times the magnetic field divided by something called the Dreiser field. And for those of you who have not heard of the Dreiser field, it's basically the electric field you can apply to a plasma uh, before it starts to uh, make the electrons accelerate without stopping. If you have an electric field that's applied and it's less than the Dreiser field, particle have enough collisions that it'll act like a ordinary conductor on Earth. You know, you can assign a resistivity to it, particles will have lots of collisions, you can use classical collisional theory. If the electric field is stronger than that, Dreiser electric field, then electrons don't collide often enough. They accelerate between each collision and they run away. They get runaway electrons and they can get to almost as high as energy as there were no collisions at all. So what you see here for these numbers is that both in solar active region and certainly true in the terrestrial plasma sheet, uh, that number is huge. It's 10 to the 7th, which means that the electric fields that are generated during a flare and during mo mass motions of a flare are uh, 10 million times greater than the electric fields to prevent, that you need to limit uh, to prevent runaway electrons. So uh, it's not really the case that the solar in the solar corona in flares that you can treat it as a collisional system. To really be safe to use collisional theory, you need to get down to like the photosphere, or low chromosphere or below. So once you get into the interior of the sun, it's very collisional. So I'm going to divide this uh, energy talk up into kind of three sections, and I'll kind of pop back and forth between solar and magnetospheric. And I want to address for the next few slides energy storage. So most of both the substorm phenomena and uh, most models of solar flares. Um, have a period where they store, they create magnetic energy that somehow can be stored and accessed. And uh, so that's, we'll talk about that first. Excuse me. Yep. It should be, uh, Carl wants to make a comment here. I think it's online. I think it's actually maybe online at the moment because I sent my PowerPoint files in uh, a few days ago. Uh, they have more slides than I have time to show, so I've been deleting them. So you'll, you'll see more in the online ones than you'll see here. Uh, but yeah, and uh, particularly I, I have some movies coming up. If you see anything that takes your fancy and you would like to have a copy of it, come talk to me now. I have flash drives and we can put it on your system. Uh, but some of the movies are kind of big. So uh, it's kind of hard sometimes to download them. So let's do the, the CME, the coronal mass ejection energetics first. Uh, and uh, when we look at a typical large, I wanted to say average, but very, because there are a lot of small ones, many more small ones than big ones, but a, a typically large uh, CME, um, uh, we typically find velocities of something like 1,000 kilometers per second. I think the record velocity is now 3,000 kilometers per second or 3,200 kilometers per second, which I find astounding because uh, if you do the numbers, that's 1% the speed of light. And when you realize that they're typically like 10 to the 16 grams or even larger, to accelerate 10 to the 16 grams to uh, the speed of light, 1% the speed of light, and it happens in about five minutes. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty fantastic. But let's not go so big as 1% uh, speed of light. Let's just do 1,000 kilometers per second. And uh, so you can get the kinetic energy out. You can use a coronagraph to get the line of sight density so you can measure the, the mass well enough to get out a number of 10 to, 10 to the 32 ergs just in kinetic energy. And then the radiation actually varies a lot. Uh, in some cases, it can be as large as 10 to the 32 ergs. Sometimes it's maybe only 10 to the 31. Um, and then you're also doing work against gravity. Strong sun has a very strong gravitational field, um, but that's typically uh, not so as important as the thermal and kinetic energies. And uh, the volume that would be involved in a kind of a CME like that is about 10 to the fifth kilometers cubed. 
Uh, so you have an energy density that you're needing to generate of about 100 ergs per cubic centimeter. So your source needs to kind of be able to supply that. And uh, if you look at the numbers here, and think of this uh, as what the conditions are prior to the flare. So where are we going to get 100 ergs per cubic centimeter? I'm probably preaching to the choir here since I don't think anybody is going to argue about that, that they're going to say that magnetic fields are unimportant. But um, if you just look at the motions that exist in the corona prior, that are you know, due to solar convection and things like that, the velocities from solar convection are typically one kilometer per second or less, usually a, lot, usually a tenth of a kilometer per second. Densities in the corona are in, so the kind of kinetic energy density that's already present is pretty tiny, 10 to the minus 5 ergs per cubic centimeter. Uh, thermal, you've got plasma that's about a million degrees Kelvin in the corona, and that's about a tenth of an erg per cubic centimeter. Um, gravitational, if something fell down, you know, if it were like a balloon, so you had a lot of mass fall down, some kind of cavity rose up, um, that's only about a half an erg per cubic centimeter. And the magnetic field wins the prize. Uh, with 100 Gauss field, you have very strong fields, thousands of Gauss right in an active region low down. So this is kind of a, an ambient, an average number, heavily weighted toward the base. Um, you can easily get 400 ergs per cubic centimeter energy density. Now I showed this one time, uh, I think it was at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, and uh, one of the senior professors, they're even more senior than I am, uh, said, uh, how come you don't have photons on that list? What about, what about the radiation from the sun? And I, at the time, I was kind of stumped. Like, oh, well, yeah, I, you know, I should. Well, the answer, now I have the answer uh, 20 years after he asked me that question is one of the things that happens when the flare goes off is so we see a lot more photons, not fewer. We don't, it's not a dark uh, light event. If photons were an energetic source, they would have to like disappear and their energy would go away and you'd see a big splurge of blackness on the sun as the photons are converted into other energy. So more photons come out than go in. So they don't enter into that energy budget. Um, so we want to store magnetic energy in the corona. And uh, there are two ways people have still talk about for doing this. Uh, one is to take a uh, magnetic field that might be initially have no current density. And uh, if you stretch it, if you move the foot points of the field around on the surface of the sun, you can create currents that flow more or less along the uh, magnetic field, what's called force-free fields, because J is parallel to B. And the reason it's argued that it has to be J parallel to B comes from the fact that that thermal energy density was so low. We don't have a lot of strong pressure, thermal pressure in the corona, and you can't support strong pressure gradients, thermal pressure gradients. Um, so if you were limited to just the gas pressure gradients that you could support, you wouldn't be able to create enough current enough uh, magnetic field to power the flare. So generally, you ignore the pressure gradients and just talk about current flowing mostly along B. So that's one way. It's a volumetric system. Current is spread throughout the volume of the, of the sheared magnetic field lines. And then the other one is the uh, current sheet. And the emerging flux model was very popular in the early 1970s. Uh, the idea is you'd have some little bubble of magnetic field coming up through the convection zone it would encounter some pre-existing field that would create a little current sheet. And the idea is the current sheet might grow and grow and grow. And then something would happen. Some kind of micro instability would happen. And the current sheet would then disappear. And you'd get heating. And you'd get a flare. It's not clear how to get a coronal mass ejection from that. Um, it's still quite possible that processes, or processes like that go on uh, for coronal heating. But there are little kind of uh, current sheets, uh, little ones low down. Uh, you can kind of rule that out in tr Yeah, excellent. Yeah, the magnetic carpet. She's asking about what about magnetic carpet? Well, that gets into the question of the, the little current sheets. One of the, the um, uh, things that come, I'm not the expert on coronal heating, but one of the ideas is that you have a lot of little magnetic structures. You have salt and pepper. When you look at the uh, photospheric magnetic field low down, close up, it's had a lot of graininess to it. And if you make little models, you have little bubbles everywhere. And they have lifetimes of like 15 to 20 minutes. The little magnetic features are coming and going, coming and going. And they're quite strong. They're like 1,000 or 2,000 Gauss flux tubes. We're talking about flux tubes in Mark's talk this morning. And that creates what's called a magnetic carpet. A kind of, uh, it's like a, this, this floor looks flat. 
But if you get down on your hands and knees and get your micro, micro uh, scope out or your uh, magnifying glass out, you'll see all these little threads and things. And if you imagine they're magnetic field lines and reconnecting, that create a lot of heat. And it does it by current sheets. That's why I'm saying that uh, this has only really been kind of discarded for the big events, a big macroscopic event, because we don't see any physical evidence for a large scale current sheet. And as theory has gone along, it's hard to imagine how such a current sheet could get very big without doing something. The reconnection is actually fairly easy. Even I'm going to talk about how hard it is. Nature doesn't seem to have that trouble, and it seems to be able to get rid of current sheets almost as soon as they form. I'm dying to, to answer Mark's question because I know the, I know two ways to answer it. <laughs> and uh, one is, uh, if you want to sound unimpressed with, the, with ergs, uh, I calculated that uh, a, a mosquito wing flapping, we're talking about mosquitoes at lunch, uh, some of us, and uh, uh, a mosquito wing, I think it's only like a quarter of flap on one side. That's about one erg. So in that sense, you think, uh, 10 to the 32 mosquito wing flaps, that doesn't sound, I'm not too impressed. However, I sit there and, and go more, um, more right wing on you and say that uh, it's equivalent to everybody on Earth having their own 100 megaton bomb and setting it off at the same time. And that, that would still wouldn't make 10 to the 32. That would probably be about 10 to the 30 or 31. Uh, then everybody's very impressed. <laughs> All right, so, uh, yeah, so we're working on that 10 to the 32 ergs. Now, um, the, uh, the other thing that comes into this, besides storage, and I'm going to work my way toward it, is we not only need to kind of store energy. Uh, it's really hard to separate out all these physics pieces. It all has to blend together in a nice mathematical, consistent way. But as the onset, we need to release that energy very quickly. These large events um, uh, typically take about a, uh, anywhere from a minute or two to five minutes to release the energy, which is about the time it takes for a magnetic wave, an alpha wave. I can say alpha wave in this audience and not have entirely blank faces. That's about the time it takes for an alpha wave to travel across the scale size of the system. So the wave communication time is the t all the time you need for the whole thing to take off and to release that energy. So it happens very quickly. Then there's a gradual phase that can go on for many, many hours uh, releasing uh, energy. Um, that middle plot is just showing some soft x-rays. These are coming from the thermal emissions and the flare, flare loops. Uh, recovery I will get to also later on, hopefully, after the break. Um, and uh, the recovery is when a lot of the energy is actually being released. Um, early on, 40 years ago, people were very focused on the impulsive phase of the flare. It was very tempting. You see that onset curve to think that everything happened in five minutes and everything after that was simply cooling. Flare is a five minute event, all the energy released, after that it's just getting cooling off. But in fact, that's not the case. Um, careful calculations, quantitative calculations and observations combined show that there's as much energy released during that gradual phase as is released during that impulsive phase. It's coming out at a lower rate over a much longer time, many, many hours. But if you add it all up, it's about the same. So there is in fact a lot of energy being generated all during that gradual phase. I'm very careful never to call it a cooling phase because it's not really a cooling phase. It's a decline, it's a gradual phase. Um, and uh, just the thermal mission, to, the energy needed to sustain those x-ray loops, which are what you're seeing plotted as soft x-ray there, like the loops below, um, those exist for many, many hours and they're emitting a lot of radiative energy. Um, I'll go in, I think a little bit more later on into exactly what's happening with the loops. I might mention it a little bit here just because there is a counterpart in the magnetosphere. Um, you can kind of think of this as the aurora. Don't think too hard about it because <laughs> it's just an analogy. 
but you have reconnection going up in a current sheet. It's releasing energy. And you have conduction electrons, energetic particles, or probably both, coming down, impacting the surface, the photosphere, chromosphere, and uh, ablating material. The usual word is evaporation. The material then is driven back up into the system. And that's what you're seeing in this nice bright loop. And the reason you can see the lower loop so well and you can't see hardly anything above is because this evaporation increases the density in that loop about 100 times over the density elsewhere. Now, if you think in the Earth's magnetosphere, does anything like that happen? When you have reconnection going on on the magneto tail, you have energy released and uh, you get um, uh, evaporation and even, there are even X-rays produced in the auroral regions coming from the bombardment of particles uh, associated with the substorm. Um, so there is, there's a bit of a counterpart. And so we're doing reconnection on the sun. Now, one of the homework problems, the one I said that was the easiest, is related to this figure. Uh, this is a simple idea of reconnection, how reconnection works on the sun. And the thing that makes it simple on the sun that's not so simple in the case of the uh, Earth's magnetosphere is that the magnetic field lines that go into the photosphere, like that sunspot you see in the movie below, uh, are really more or less anchored there for a long time. Sunspots can last months. Flare onset is like a few minutes. And um, the magnetic field lines that are up in the coronet, when they go into the, uh, the uh, photosphere, they're very well anchored at some level. We have conductor all the way. And you don't see, uh, it's very hard to see. I'm actually going to show you some in movies that uh, were, it's not quite true. But generally, you don't see sunspots move around. You don't see magnetic fibers moving around. They look almost stationary. What you're seeing here are flare ribbons um, I can't remember if this is H alpha or G band or what this was exactly, this image. Uh, but it's from uh, the Solar Optical Telescope, which was operated here at uh, uh, HAO uh, on, Yo on uh, Hinode. So there's a Hinode image. And you're seeing a flare go off, and you're seeing flare ribbons, which you see move apart in time. And that motion is an apparent motion. Notice the sunspot doesn't seem to care that a ribbon went across the top of it. It just sits there and does its thing. The penumbra and the umbra are undisturbed in the sunspot. And you can see flare loops in emission spanning the two ribbons. And so that motion has been understood since 1964 as being due to magnetic red connection. It was actually um, Carmichael, uh, a nuclear physicist in Canada, who first realized that you could explain uh, this ribbon motion uh, as being due to reconnection. So um, it was not a solar person. It wasn't even an American. It was a Canadian. <laughs> there we go. I hope I'm trying to try to give uh, some credit here to the Canadians that are in the audience. Um, and sometimes I think it takes an outsider to come in and see the obvious. Your task, by the way, in the homework is to kind of come up with a little formula. I ask you a little bit about the formula that you can use to convert uh, some of this information, this motion information, into electric field measurements. I'll say more about that later after the break. Let's get back to the storage issue. Um, if we do a, uh, a force-free magnetic field with currents flowing along, that's what I, what I mostly have been working on, um, the uh, magnetic field that we can extract because of this line time, because of this anchoring of the field in the photosphere, we can't really extract magnetic field from sunspots. Some people think we can, but I, I don't think so. I don't see any evidence of magnetic fields being given up by sunspots. What you do see is lots of evidence that the magnetic field coming from currents flowing in the corona, that's B coronal current up there, um, that seems to change a lot during a flare. And that, I think, is the source of the energy for the flare on the CME. And uh, typically, that amount of a magnetic field is about the same as the magnetic field from the photospheric currents. Uh, in more complex systems, that can be increased a lot, many times greater than the photospheric currents. But typically, I would say they're, they're co-equal. So about half of the magnetic field in the corona can be extracted in a flare region. The other half, probably not. And people try to make quantitative estimates of how much is in each by uh, looking at things like uh, solar prominences and H alpha image, looking at plage regions and prominence, trying to fit models to it and see how much current that they need to actually put along field lines in order to get twisted structures that match the observations. So that's a kind of typical way you can, there are other ways to do it, but that's one way to get out these numbers. 
And I want to mention this because I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit here about the uh, people that still want to make the CMEs and flares by having energy come through the photosphere. Um, it's not entirely smooth sailing for these storage models. One of the things that's puzzled people, not so much recently, but 10 years ago, it was a big puzzle, uh, was the fact that if you're going to extract energy from the magnetic field, you have to do that at the same time that you stretch the magnetic field. When a coronal mass ejection goes off, these field lines are stretched out. After all, it's those stretched field lines that are reconnecting. Well, it takes energy to stretch magnetic field. You don't get energy out from stretching magnetic field. So how do you, how do you extract energy from the magnetic field in the corona and at the same time stretch these field lines? So this kind of quandary, uh, I've called it the ali Storock paradox. Um, when Jean-Jacques Ali and Peter Storock were both going to solar meetings, it was a very popular phrase. Now, I don't see them anymore at solar meetings. But um, anyway, Jean-Jacques Ali in France pointed out that this is uh, to actually have an eruption that's driven magnetically by uh, magnetic uh, occurrence, magnetic field such as occurrence in the corona. It's actually impossible to do that and completely open the field out to infinity and then relax it. So the ABC is shown up there. It uh, can't really happen. And that's based on theoretical grounds. That's the, the dashed line, uh, the blue thing that's forbidden. And uh, what you can do is you can do an ideal thing, but you have to have some kind of resistive process happen before it's fully open. So you can't completely separate out the phases. Um, I think it's become clear that reconnection starts right away, so the big current sheet never appears without any reconnection having already started. Now, just to talk a little bit about uh, the fact that not everybody is entirely happy with storage models but I would say 90, 99% are happy with it. Um, but here's uh, work by Jimmy Chen. Uh, and they had come up with a, uh, it's really kind of an old idea. People have thought about it even in the last, uh, early last century, uh, what's called a flux injection model. And in this model, the, there's a mysterious, unexplained generator hidden down somewhere in the photosphere or preferably below where there's no data to check it and for which no theory is given that somehow is able to generate a pulse of current or a pulse of flux which goes through the photosphere. It does this on an alphane time scale. Uh, so that's a very strange thing. The, not the alphane time scale of the photosphere or the, or the convection zone, but the alphane time scale of the corona. How you, how you would get the photosphere to create uh, something so quickly in an organized way that's a thousand times faster than the local wave time, time scale, I don't know. But that's what they suppose. And, uh, they inject flux then, all the flux they need to drive the flare, uh, through the surface. And one of the things that's in the chapter uh, six of, uh, I think it's volume two, uh, is I go through this calculation. And if you actually calculate uh, for a 10 to the 32 erg flare, how much motion would be generated over how big an area for how long, you'll see it would make a tremendous disturbance in the photospheric surface. You couldn't miss it. And that sunspot would not look like you see in that image, just sitting there doing nothing. It would be an almighty disturbance. Now there is actually, it is actually possible to detect some disturbance in the, um, in the photosphere. We had some people I mentioned, I remember we're talking about the fact that they were working on uh, convection zone and uh, flare emissions. I was hoping that movie would repeat. Let's back it up a little bit. This is a movie from the MDI on SOHO, an instrument which is actually seeing here um, a, an acoustic wave generated by a flare. This is work by Sobachev, reported in 1998. And a flare is going off, we can get it to play properly. There it is, you see a kind of ripple, like a rock had been thrown in a fish pond, and you see the, the ripples coming out from the pond and the water. And there was a very intense heating spot that happened, and you see these acoustic waves coming out. These are not the chromospheric waves, they are going, they are consistent with uh, the alphane time scale in the acoustic time scale in the photosphere and convection zone. And they're actually happening after the flare has gone off. You can see a delay of about a minute for the signal to propagate from the corona and impact the photosphere. This was uh, a very weak signal. It's very difficult to detect these events. They were predicted in the 1970s and people searched hard for 20 years to see anything, but they're there. But that doesn't mean that we're injecting flux in big time through the, um, through the photosphere. 
So it's not entirely true that you can't see if anything happened in the photosphere. You can, but you have to look really hard, and you have to have a really good instrument. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about the substorm and magnetosphere. There, uh, we actually, I think, understand things a lot better. Of course, it's easy when it's in your own backyard. Uh, we know that solar wind kinetic energy is transferred into magnetic energy when the interplanetary magnetic field goes southward, and we create a stretch a tail, and then at some point, we have an onset. We still, as far as I know, uh, I don't go to all the current meetings, but I still think it's a big controversy as to what event, what physics actually triggers the, uh, magneto the tail current sheet to reconnect in a form of what's called a near-Earth neutral line at about 15 Earth radii. And so that's a, still a big issue. People have been thinking about it for a long time, but it's a tricky issue. And I do know some theories, uh, some of them which are not that different from the solar case. Um, the trigger thing is still, still an issue. The storage thing, not so much so. Um, and I just reminding here that we're gonna go through the same phases of energy storage, the creation of a tail. We have here a DNL, which is a distant neutral line uh, for some reason, unexplained, a near-Earth neutral line, NENL forms, we could have a magnetic island, which is ejected out of the system. And uh, then we have recovery, that near-Earth neutral line moves out, becomes a distant neutral line. That's the, the general picture on the night side for the substorm. And the, the uh, evidence for the importance of the terrestrial magnetic field was really hammered home with this wonderful study that Foster did in 1971 was published. And what you're seeing here is a plot here of the Royal Letterjet Index, AE, which is that solid line. Now, uh, I would expect only magnetospheric people to know what the AE index is. But what this is, is an index created from, I think it used to be about 11 stations, mostly in the northern hemisphere. Now it may be more distributed. Uh, a lot of them were in Siberia, I remember. And it's simply using a ground-based magnetometer to look at deflections in the magnetic field when currents flow in the Earth's ionosphere. So you set a little sensitive uh, magnetic field detector, magnetometer, a compass, a really good compass will do it if you let go and it's super sensitive, and you wait for storms to go off and you see this uh, horizontal component of the field change on the Earth, and you put it all together and you process it a little bit and you come up with something called the auroral electro electrojet index, measuring the current flow in the auroral zone. And what Foster shows, that was beautifully correlated with the southward turning of the interplanetary magnetic field. So BZ was the north-south magnetic field component in the solar wind in the interplanetary magnetic field. Um, and you can see there's about a 30 minutes, maybe an hour of storage going on. And then something happens and the energy is released. A big aurora occurs all over the Earth. Yep. There is a little bit of a time lag, and there were lots of papers written since 1971 uh, trying to understand exactly what's going on. And um, the uh, time lag, as I understand it, is mostly due to the time it takes for alpha N waves to propagate from the day side of the magnetosphere into the tail. It takes about 35 minutes for, for this time lag, for everything to get going, for the ionospheric convection to get set up and, and dragged on. Um, let's see if we get, I have more on this somewhere coming up. Uh, not yet. Uh, what I wanted to point out here was that uh, that Foster plot became very famous, this beautiful correlation. And there are, from time to time, um, not so much recently, but people have tried to see if anything like that happens on the sun. Is there any place on the sun where we might have some kind of southward turning which would set off reconnection? And there's a very nice study here by Joan Feynman and Sarah Martin. Um, which I will show shortly, this is the theory part. But what they had in mind was something like I'm showing here. We have a flux rope, some kind of structure which is going to erupt. But suppose we had a little bubble come up and we had some reconnection, but the reconnection itself didn't make a flare. It was minor. But it would cut field lines, remove field lines lying over top of the flux rope and trigger it to go unstable. So you could easily imagine here that the new emerging flux, that it's called right here, NEF, that if it has the right orient orientation, you get something like this, you get the reconnection and the flux rope would be released. But if it had the wrong orientation, I rotate it the other way around, nothing would happen. No reconnection would occur, there would be no eruption. So uh, they wanted to see a new study to see if they could find such a thing. And uh, let me just go to that study. So it's an, not a not nice 
colorful slide, but it's still very meaningful. Uh, so they did some tables. And they looked for emerging flux near a filament, yes or no, did some sorting. And was table two was the filament oriented favorable for reconnection and unfavorable. And without dragging you through all the numbers, uh, the results are kind of mixed. There's some hint of a correlation, but it's nothing as dramatic as what was seen in the magnetosphere. It was not a nice cut and dried, oh yeah, we always get a flare if this comes up. It depended a lot on how close the uh, newly emerging flux was to the, to the flux roof, to existing uh, prominence. If it was close, it always erupted. It didn't matter about the orientation. If it was distance away, then there was some hint of a correlation, but not perfect. Sure, yeah, I was, I kind of skipped over part of that. Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, so I did a uh, study with a student, this was actually part of his PhD thesis, in which we took a simple model, this is actually a very simple kind of toy model, just a two-dimensional, nice flux rope, you can do it, most of it analytical. There's a, some of the equations need a bit of computer processing to work them out. But we go through and look at the force bounce on the system, uh, and uh, we're conserving energy, so we're not, we're, we have stored energy in the system and trying to release it. And what we found is that indeed there are critical points. If you uh, move, like increase the strength of the new emerging flux slowly in time, like it might really happen on the sun, little sunspots coming up, it gets stronger and stronger. Uh, so as with time, its strength would increase, you could push, you could make the flux rope erupt. Uh, there are critical points in the configuration where no equilibrium is possible, and you get what's called a loss of equilibrium. And it could happen in many different ways. Even in this simple model, it was very complicated. Uh, you could also uh, move the position of the new emerging flux. Suppose it got further away or closer. There were different things you could do that would make an eruption. But the main, the main result of the study was that there was no clear-cut correlation with the orientation. Uh, you could set up a system so it would look like it would have something like that. But generally, if you just played around with all possibilities, uh, whether it was favorable or unfavorable, didn't always make a lot of difference whether it was going to erupt or not. So our conclusion was that uh, it might be possible to observe some correlation, and it might tell you something about how new emerging flux would occur, but there was no clear, what actually triggers the flux rope to erupt doesn't always imply just simple, simply cutting. Sometimes you can cut those steel lines it's called tether cutting, I think I said already, my reconnection, but it doesn't do anything. It just slowly evolves, you know, okay, so okay. All right, so I don't have as much on me, I just move up a little bit, I'm happy now, you know. So you actually get an erupt, it's more complicated than simply um, cutting field lines. But I don't know anyone who's really gone into this, and uh, one of the things about the 2D model that really impressed me was how, how complicated it was to sort everything out that could happen. And I, uh, I shudder, I shake, to think what, would, what you would have to try to do in three dimensions to sort everything out. It must be incredibly complicated in reality with 3D and more complicated structures. Um, but let's get on with uh, trigger mechanism here. Uh, I think we're actually at break time, aren't we? Yes, you are. So let's stop. Let's have a 15-minute break. And uh, yeah, I see people fleeing the room in the back. I figure I must be running out. <laughs> so, we'll come back at five after. <laughs>